Good afternoon. This is Ann Greiner, President and CEO of the Patient Center Primary Care Collaborative, and welcome to the PCPCC webinar, Putting the Medical Home into Practice for Children. Uh, this is one of two PCPCC webinars in the month of July. The next webinar is on July 17th, and it's focused on integrating physical and behavioral health, the view from primary care providers and payers. And on that webinar, we'll have the Harvard Center for Primary Care and UPMC. Uh, before we get into today's really, really exciting program and the wonderful speakers that we have, let me just also uh, remind you of some other upcoming events. Um, on August 8th, the PCPCC is going to release its 2018 evidence report. And this year, our evidence report will examine the relationship between patient-centered medical homes and accountable uh, care organizations. If you are in town, Washington, D.C., uh, we'd love for you to attend that event. Um, we'll put all information on our website shortly and um, uh, reach out uh, to our members as well to invite them. Uh, we also have a upcoming annual conference on November 8th, followed by a workshop that's going to focus on one of uh, the primary care community's most important policy initiatives, which is to get more investment into primary care. Without uh, further ado, um, let me turn to our panelists, but first remind you that you can chat questions into the chat box. We've already gotten um, dozens of really wonderful questions um, when you all signed up for this webinar. And I also want to note that uh, the webinar is being recorded and we will post it on our website within 24 hours. Uh, let me now introduce our panelists. Um, Dr. Susan Kresley is board certified in pediatrics and clinical informatics, and she's a fellow of the American Academy of Pediatrics. She got her medical degree from Temple, um, and she's been in practice in the Doylston, Pennsylvania area since 1990. She has an independent pediatric practice and has been a recognized medical home since 2011. Uh, she's past president of the Pennsylvania chapter of the AAP, and she is involved in a number of organizations and in particular serves as medical director for Conniac Software. So I think um, Dr. Kresley really spans both um, clinical care and um, informatics uh, in, in her work life. Um, Suzanne Madden is founder and CEO of the Verdon Group, and they are a consulting firm serving independent medical practices with a particular focus on pediatrics. Um, she is uh, a serial entrepreneur, very exciting, and she's co-founder of the Patient-Centered Solutions, which really focuses on helping practices transition um, to PCMH. Um, she is also founder and CEO of the Policy Authority, a firm that tracks and reports on healthcare insurance policy changes that affect provider networks. Um, Suzanne speaks and uh, writes regularly on the business aspects of healthcare, so really bridges both the clinical and the business, which uh, we all know is so important. Uh, Chip Hart is the Director of Pediatric Solutions, which is a consulting wing of uh, EHR PCC, um, and uh, he is he has a very popular blog which if you are not aware of it please do sign up it's terrific it's called confessions of a pediatric practice consultant and he regularly um, presents at pediatric practice management events around the country um, and their organization um, does a lot of work obviously with pediatric practices he's got nearly 30 years of experience in the field um, you're, Chip, you're really um, an inspiration. If other um, organizations that have EHRs could be as attentive as you all are to um, clinician needs, we'd all be in a much better place when it comes to IT. So let me turn the um, baton over to Susan. Thanks very much. 
thanks so much for that introduction and good afternoon to our attendees. Um, as Anne said, I'm Sue Cressley, and while I am involved in leadership at the American Academy of Pediatrics, um, I do run my own practice, see patients in our family-centered medical home, and I hope to add some real-world experience to today's discussion. Today, I'm going to focus on what is unique to pediatrics regarding family-centered care and discuss some opportunities and challenges. We will provide the attendees with more helpful resources if you'd like to learn more at the end of this discussion. So you will, should first take a note that this slide does not say patient-centered. That's intentional. Um, putting children, adolescents, and young adults at the center of care without realizing the crucial importance of their family misses key elements of the pediatric medical home. And I also think it's worth reviewing some history here. Uh, the family-centered medical home started with the American Academy of Pediatrics back in the 1960s. And the first known documentation of the term medical home appeared in 1967 in a book entitled Standards of Child Health Care. It really emphasized the importance of centralized medical records to children with special health care needs. But since that time, and evolving into the 1980s, the current medical home concept expanded beyond children with special health care needs and eventually led to consensus among other major primary care associations to develop what we call the 2007 medical home joint principles. On the right, you'll see the agenda for children put out annually by the American Academy of Pediatrics. And this is an example how the family-centered medical home model holds a prominent place in the fabric of the AAP. So most of you are familiar with the medical home concept and understand that it's really an approach to providing primary care. It focuses on building strong and trusted partnerships with families and communities and those partnerships are really key to success. Um, many of us in, uh, who have transformed our practices into medical homes have included family advisors as part of our practice teams, and we'll talk about that a little bit more uh, later in the presentation. But we all know that the family-centered medical home should be grounded in care that's accessible, family-centered, continuous, comprehensive, coordinated, compassionate and culturally effective. So I encourage you to learn more at the Medical Home Implementation website. The URL is listed on your slide for your convenience. And there are several core functions that should be applied within the primary care setting in order to support the seven medical home tenants. Uh, Team-based care is key. And it's important to note that for children, their team may change as their needs change. So for example, a new single mother, the team might be a lactation consultant, her obstetrician to help manage postpartum depression, and a community social worker to help her find more appropriate housing. But when that child grows up and is a teen and perhaps has depression and asthma, the team might include the school nurse and the school psychologist, as well as a community psychiatrist, and the child's parents and perhaps step-parents. Notice the team in this team-based care isn't just all of the people working in the pediatric office. We need to expand our notion of the care team to those people who are helping in the best interest of the family outside the office walls. The above examples point out the need for the family to be at the center of the care team and shared decision-making with patients and families is important to achieve the best outcomes and for all members of the team to feel that they're successful and satisfied that they have a key role. Transitions of care are an integral part of pediatrics as adolescents and young adults naturally age out of our pediatric practices to adult-based care. Thoughtful transitions have significant impact on children with special health care needs, but are appropriate for all children and adolescents. Meaningful care coordination reduces stress on the caregivers, the families, and the office, and improves outcomes, especially in children with complex needs. It's important to note that coordination should be integrated and have a systems-based approach that goes beyond the medical community to incorporate schools, community organizations, and others. 
And cultural competency really requires us as pediatric primary care clinicians to practice cultural humility. It goes beyond translating information into preferred languages, and it involves us recognizing and acknowledging our own inherent biases in treatment of patients and their families. So transforming the pediatric practice into a true medical home can be an important path to realizing the quadruple aim. Most of you are familiar with the triple aim, which includes reducing costs, improving quality, and improving family experience and satisfaction. But I want to point out that this model also has significant wins for the fourth aim, which is clinician experience and satisfaction. There has been much written recently about burnout among healthcare team members, and in many practices, including my own, the medical home model has more evenly distributed the workload among care team members, and all team members are engaged and energized as they understand their roles and their value. My staff goes home feeling like they accomplish something meaningful every day and come to work excited to be able to help families. Our clinicians are no longer feeling like they have to do everything. So let's talk about the unique opportunities and challenges in pediatrics. Pediatricians are facing challenges in healthcare delivery, expectations, and in changes in societal and demographics. While these are challenges, it also can be an opportunity to be innovative and transform the way we deliver care and demonstrate our value as child health experts. Accessibility does not mean we have to have our offices open 24 hours a day every day, but it would be short-sighted if we ignored retail health clinics and consumer demands for convenience. So what does this look like in an innovative practice? It may mean accepting walk-in patients. It may mean a robust patient portal experience. It may mean integrating telehealth within the medical home or having early morning appointments for busy families. It is important for us to align the practice offerings with what the families value. Our practice learned early on to ask our families what they wanted before adjusting our provider schedules. We also learned that they wanted to speak to a trusted member of our office team, not a third-party answering service. So we adjusted our office hours and who takes on call appropriately. So adequate payment is key to all of this work. If the medical home doesn't have enough financial resources to deliver great care, it can't survive. The realization of decreased, decreased costs to the overall healthcare system must come with the understanding that good care coordination, integration of mental health, population health management, all of that requires adequate resources for the medical home to do this important work on an ongoing basis. The American Academy of Pediatrics strongly recommends that payment models must start with the understanding that pediatrics is different. Investment in the health and well-being of a young child may not show societal dividends for decades, and it may be measured differently than simply reduced hospitalizations. Pediatricians and pediatric subspecialists should serve as expert advisors in developing alternative payment models that make sense and are not just adapted from adult chronic care models. Children are not simply smaller adults, and the models to pay for the family-centered medical home has to be altered appropriately. In order for family-centered medical homes to thrive, adequate payment should reflect the full range of services that we offer, including non-face-to-face -face encounters, telehealth, which may explain expand the reach to the family outside the office walls. There needs to be adequate payment for vaccines, medications, other medical products in, provided in the medical home, like spacers for children with asthma. It needs to have adequate payment for care coordinators to do important work, as well as recall patients um, for appropriate services and closed care gaps. Withholding payments should be avoided as this diminishes resources to the practice and then just decreases the practice's ability to meet the needs of the families they care for. 
So there are plenty of alternative payment models that don't just apply to pediatrics. They are being applied in adult and mixed populations. However, implementing them must take into consideration the uniqueness of the pediatric population. There are currently, for example, no good risk adjustment models for pediatric populations. And when we talk about children, we have to include considerations for social determinants of health and integrating mental health concerns. In addition, it's not just the children's social determinants and their mental health, but those of their caretakers and family members that have significant impact and the cost to care for children. Bundled payments in some arenas have been successful, but all of these models only work if there is enough uh, resources and appropriate payment to cover the cost of providing a high quality family-centered medical home. So I'm including in these slides a bunch of helpful resources. These will be given to you as um, a handout and are available. Um, and I encourage you to read through all of these, including some of the American Academy of Pediatrics practice transformation resources, so that for those of you who are beginning this journey, um, you can learn from those who have gone before you. Thank you. Sue, thanks so much for your very informative uh, talk. I am going to dive into uh, really utilizing PCMH for operational efficiency and profitability. Uh, you've uh, done a fantastic job of outlining for us just, you know, all of the, the benefits from sort of, you know, the population health perspective as well as what's going on at the practice level. What I think is often left off the table here is really just um, how beneficial PCMH is as an operational tool, right? To really streamline your practice, streamline your operations, and uh, frankly, just uh, sort of get effectiveness and efficiencies of scale across your organizations in deploying this model. So if you do it for no other reason than, you know, wanting to be more operationally efficient, then patient-centered medical home is a fantastic resource for you. Now, what I uh, intend to do over the next couple of minutes, time is tight, certainly there's so much that can be said about this, uh, this model, um, but in the interest of time, the way I've organized these slides is to really sort of talk about some of the benefits of adopting the medical home model, uh, and for each sort of uh, aspect that I want to pull out, just kind of talk in general terms about best use of, you know, staff, best use of tech, et cetera, as a sort of, um, you know, a general case study. I'll talk a little bit about some specific results too, but uh, Chip Hart at the end of my presentation will take over and really give us some fantastic numbers that illustrate just what can be done once a PCMH uh, model is actually implemented in your practice. So a very high level, you know, the benefits of adopting a medical home practice really uh, touch all aspects of your practice. The clinical staff work at the top of their license. It saves time and money. All of these points I'll, I'll illustrate and illuminate a little further as we go. But I, I clearly see that over and over again in our work at Patient-Centered Solutions in helping practices to transform, right? We, we really see the benefits of having everybody pull oars in the same direction. And the staff are really keen to also sort of, you know, show off their chops, if you will, right? To really demonstrate their skills and to get um, into uh, these projects in a way that, you know, typically their average workaday just wasn't allowing them to do. We see better coordination across, special to, across specialists and incorporation of community resources, right? No one practice can do it all, regardless of what size you are. And so being able to, you know, tap into specialists and community resources to help further your reach and deliver these much needed services to patients is really very critical and PCMH helps to show you how. There's certainly an increase in technology use uh, and we see over and over just an improvement on the return of investment in EMRs and practice management systems there is a lot that most of these systems can do and being able to you know really utilize the data that you're putting in every day into your EMR uh, helps to um, to really benefit you in terms of uh, managing your population health 
and other areas too, frankly. Um, it certainly allows for more comprehensive services and an improved service mix to be delivered at your practice. For example, by looking at you know various areas where care may be a little deficient, or you just haven't had the time or the resources to put time and attention around that, like managing asthmatics better, um, or you know coming up with nutritional programs in, in uh, for um, you know pediatric obesity programs, those sorts of things. By simply sort of looking at the data, being able to work through a PCMH project time and attention is being put on these areas of you know, potential deficiencies. And that really allows practices to move towards a sort of a greater service mix. Certainly positions practices for pay for performance and value-based contracting. I'll talk a little bit in depth about that. And we also see that this improves revenues per, per, per visit, right? So by actually putting the time and attention on what are the things that our patients actually need and what do we need to do uh, while we're in the room with these patients, fewer things fall through the cracks. You know, things are, are much better organized. And uh, as a result, we actually see a little bit of a bounce in revenues per visit. Um, and also the seasonal cash flow dips, I'll, I'll speak to you a little bit, uh, particularly in pediatrics, right? The summer season, you hope that flu hasn't extended the whole way into the summer. And so there's certainly seasonal dips in terms of um, the services that are delivered to the pediatric population. And last but not least, we see an increase in patient satisfaction simply by being more engaged in their health. So let's talk a little bit about best use of staff and resources, right? Having staff work up to the best of their capability is not only more efficient, it's certainly more satisfying for the staff. So we typically see lower turnover. I'd like to quantify this one day to actually take a group of practices and, and see what their turnover was historically and then what it was after they transitioned to a PCMH. But anecdotally, what we see and hear from um, many uh, resources across practices is that they, they really are just much more, you know, happier with the work that they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis, right? The nurses are able to sort of utilize their triage and follow-up skills. Physicians and providers are focused on care delivery, right, instead of sort of figuring out where are little Timmy's lab results. That was a week ago. They didn't come in, you know, and tracking these things down and putting out fires. And workflows become much more proactive, right? It gets away from that reactionary sort of fire drill every day. The example I just used is, you know, looking for results. Um, by moving to a PCMH, uh, framework, you're, you're actually redesigning your workflows to be able to have in place a mechanism for finding where those results are before they become, you know, overdue. So that really helps to be proactive in the workflows, uh, and, and it, it really helps the staff to sort of understand who's on base. Staff um, better understand their role in the delivery of care, right? So everybody takes responsibility from the front desk, you know, all the way through the back in a way that is not typical, you know, outside of a PCMH framework. Uh, and team members get away from those silos. They tend to work more collaboratively together, whether that's, you know, sort of the huddle at the beginning of the morning or afternoon session um, or, or simply just, you know, through staff meetings and understanding that it's everybody's responsibility to deliver the most optimal care possible, we find that teams really become much more integrated over time time. So best use of staff results. We've definitely seen the decreased busy work it results in overall lower cost of care, greater staff satisfaction, less turnover, and less burnout. I'm quantifying that by saying when we work with our practices, by the time they're actually receiving their recognition from uh, NCQA, for example, they have really um, figured out how to better deploy their resources, right? Most people ask, oh my gosh, are we going to have to, you know, hire care coordinators and, you know, is it going to be much more expensive when we need more resources? What we typically find in small to mid-sized practices is that the reverse is true. People are actually working much more efficiently and more effectively. They're being proactive. They're getting out ahead of workflows. Workflow has been redesigned. And as a result, that has really um, lowered the cost of care instead of adding to it. Um, proactive workflows also allow for patient recall, right, smoothing out those dips. So I had mentioned those sort of, you know, seasonal dips that we see in the delivery of services. So it's a great time, for example, you know, after the, you know, sick rush and the camp season rush, et cetera, to be able to focus on, you know, who's overdue for a recheck, you know, for medications for asthmatics, for example, or, you know, newly diagnosed ADHD. Um, who's overdue for well visits, right? Just being able to use the technology in your EMR to be able to figure out, you know, who may be overdue or who's coming due and get out in front of that and bring them in for their visit. It really helps to sort of smooth those um, those dips. And then, you know, last but not least, uh, greater revenue per visit, as I mentioned. Things don't fall through the cracks, right? If there's a missing immunization, it gets done at that visit because it's been identified as a needed service ahead of time. 
So best uh, use of staff, a case, uh, just a quick case because I'd like to um, illuminate this. And uh, as time is tight, I will um, probably just give you some quick highlights out of the rest of the cases, but I wanted to make sure that our first one, we talked about a little bit more in depth. Um, for provider client in Florida, reduced staff turnover by 30% in two years after medical home implementation. So this is one um, practice that we did not actually do the study on, but heard anecdotally from them that staff turnover was a really big problem. And they took a look back, you know, over their books, uh, over a period of two years and realized that their staff turnover had decreased substantially. Um, they polled their staff and the staff surveyed actually revealed greater satisfaction with their work due to being um, more involved, right? So these are some quotes, being more involved, use of their skill set and feeling part of a team rather than just in, uh, in silos. So that I thought was a pretty um, powerful uh, little case to put in front of the audience today. All right, let's talk about better coordination with specialists and community. Formal agreements with specialists really help to drive better outcomes, right? So the same sort of issues that we see inherent in workflows and fire drills where you're trying to, you know, find, hey, did that patient actually go to that specialist? Did we get the report back? Or what do we need to do next? With those formal agreements in place with specialists, we find that the turnaround time is certainly accelerated. Um, we, um, in fact, I always love to refer to Sue Cressley's um, way of getting specialists to comply. And I'd be remiss if I didn't mention it uh, here because there are some uh, pediatric practices on the line and you're probably wondering how you engage the specialist but she has a really neat way of doing that so she she sends notification out to specialists to say she would love to continue to refer to them um, however you know she needs to be able to get the um, referral notes back the consult notes back within X time frame um, if they don't comply you know straight out of the gate as most you know perhaps do not she sends a second letter that says gee it's really you know a pity that we can't continue to refer to you uh, unless you you know turn around these notes in a timely manner and, and really help us sort of you know co-manage this patient. Uh, and last but not least, and I don't know if Sue's ever pulled the trigger on this, but I like to think that every now and again, she has to send a letter to a specialist to say, for non-compliance, you know, we're no longer utilizing you. So there are ways to really, you know, engage with your specialist. But what we're finding is as the patient-centered medical home model has evolved and matured over time, um, that the specialists really are on board with this. They're familiar with this model now. They're seeing it more and more, and they really are able to, um, you know, facilitate those requests and work much more collaboratively with, with primary care and pediatricians. Turnaround time, uh, for reports, therefore, is, you know, obviously um, uh, much accelerated, so timely interventions can, uh, you know, can apply. And then from a workflow perspective, you know, at the practice, we're able to, you know, really track you know, the referrals out to the specialists, actually helping to uh, get those appointments uh, on the books with those specialists and then track when these patients are supposed to, you know, do that. Improved technology use, as I touched upon, you know, you really want to get that return on your investment for your EMR. They're not inexpensive, right? Even just the time invested daily to use them and actually get all of the information put into your EMR, you know, through notes, et cetera. Um, so you really want to be able to make use of that data in, right? All, all of the data that's gone in, you want to be able to pull out and use it. So we find the utilization of features such as reports that allow for recalling overdue patients, uh, really sort of focusing in on disparity of care across populations uh, and in using it to engage with patients to reduce phone calls, no-shows, you know, pre-visit activity, et cetera, that all helps to reduce costs too. Um, when we get to Chip's part of the presentation, he'll be able to show you some neat numbers based on utilizing technology to be able to pull out that data and to be able to use those reports for very meaningful results in terms of understanding those numbers. Um, we see improved documentation with, um, with EMR use, right? We see that if uh, the EMRs are set up appropriate to a patient-centered medical home framework, a lot more data is actually getting uh, captured, right? There are comprehensive health assessments that can be more effectively data mined for follow-up care, for identifying disparities in care, and frankly, driving better outcomes, right? Because it helps to develop care plans that are specific and meaningful to each individual patient, right? And that, that's such a, an important piece, I think, to pull out, that we really want to break down the challenges inherent for any individual patient to be able to meet a care plan. And then, of course, built in, you know, evidence support, decision support tools really help to deliver better care and create consistency of care, right? Even in group practices where there may only be four physicians, what we often find is we sit down, you know, around a table and say, okay, tell us how you're managing your asthmatics because we're going to use that, you know, as a measure to improve. And there are four different answers, right? And, and all of the partners sort of look at each other and say, wow, I didn't know you were doing that or I didn't know, you know, that that was a tool that I could use for this. And so there's, you know, really disparity in delivery of care in even, you know, quite small uh, group, um, group practices. 
So let's look at some results with improved tech, right? The ability to run reports to track patients for overdue visits is just a very simple example of this, right? It allows those practices to have, you know, less seasonality and cash flow because when they have a little bit of downtime, they're able to call those patients, get them in, get them scheduled, you know, and smooth out those, those schedules. Nobody wants to sit, sit around twiddling their thumbs, so of course that rarely happens in pediatrics, but uh, this certainly helps to smooth out the cash flow, flow too. Um, appropriate services are delivered more consistently, and that also increases revenue. So what do I mean by appropriate? services. Well, you know, if you have a, you know, newly diagnosed, uh, you know, patient with ADHD and you have, you know, put them on medications, you want to be able to recall that patient timely, see how they're doing, how are they responding to that. Uh, a lot of this stuff just sort of simply can't be done on the phone and frankly shouldn't be done on the phone. So being able to track those patients, get them recalled, get them brought in, see them, check out how they're doing is really very important uh, for, for better outcomes in care. And then the ability to deliver missed services, right? So overdue vaccines or, you know, missing depression screenings, etc. That also helps to improve revenues per visit, which is not to say these things are being done in order to solely improve revenues per visit, per, per visit but to really make the point that it, while there is so much work that really goes into being a highly effective patient-centered medical home, the reality is there is payment there for it too. Um, I'll just uh, touch back on Sue's point though about, about appropriate reimbursement. We really need to further the conversation with payers and insurance companies about what they're paying for and what they're not paying for, right? It's not acceptable to bundle screenings into well visits. There's only so much that can be done in a 15-minute well visit with a patient. If we really want to have effectiveness of care, then these very low-cost services absolutely need to be paid for uh, by the insurers, you know, at that level. Um, and so, and last but not least, you know, the uh, ability to run reports also helps to make sure that needed services, like ensuring asthmatics receive flu shots early in the season, really helps to improve care and certainly outcomes for that particular patient population. So just a couple of cases for you. You know, utilization of recall reports by a client in North Carolina, resulting in improved well visit rates between 7 and 10%. Chip, Chip has some very specific findings on that that he'll talk about. Uh, a two-provider client in New York utilized their ER, EMR data to implement recall for patients um, to schedule them for missed services, right, like screenings, immunizations, med rechecks, that sort of thing. They managed to improve their cash flow in an off-season by $75,000. So just to quantify that for you, two doctors, right, $75,000 more brought in in a particular year over the year before, all other things being the same. In other words, they hadn't significantly improved, you know, their numbers by new pa patients. They simply were doing a much better job at getting patients in timely, and therefore they were seeing the results of that in their revenues. And then last but not least, a client in California utilized their EMR to identify asthmatics, which resulted in an increased early flu immunization rate of 32%, which is really quite substantial. So positioning for value-based contracting is a subject I could talk about for the rest of the afternoon, probably through the night and into tomorrow morning too, but I have to just sort of do this in a couple of bullet points and with um, with not too much time uh, on, on my hands here. Um, so I will just uh, sort of boil this down to say that, you know, with, with uh, being able to identify key measures and specific metrics that you want to hone in on through your patient-centered medical home transition, it's actually easier to manage those metrics, right? You're, now you're tracking them. Now you have an idea of, you know, where you stand on your heat measure. Now you know what your vaccine rates are, et cetera. So being able to use your technology to get very specific about how you're performing on these metrics is really very, very helpful. It also creates greater visibility into cost drivers. There's an opportunity to limit or control those costs. And again, you know, better documentation. If you're finding gaps, you know, with vaccine rates, for example, and saying, wait, that can't be right. We do, a, you know, much better job at that. You take a look and realize that, you know, certain things may not be tracking over to, you know, your billing system, et cetera. We find that there's this much better documentation um, and uh, it supports better coding, et cetera, um, in the patient-centered medical home. And then the use of consistent protocols and visit templates, right, and all of the components that go into a comprehensive health assessment and other things that you may be using for, you know, quality improvement over time really helps to, uh, you know, helps with these measurements and helps to really understand your data, right? And then that turns into a negotiation tool. You're able to take that to the payers to say, look, this is how we're performing, and this is where we were six months ago, and this is what we've been able to do by putting some time and attention around this. Oh, and by the way, you're receiving the benefit of that. So let's talk about some shared savings here um, and see what we can do with that for those pairs that simply haven't yet 
either gotten around to having a PCMH program in place or simply, you know, have no intention to do so. Um, some of the results specific to that, we, we see that some payers have financial PCMH incentives, right, for practices that achieve recognition. And I just want to make the point that it's not just NCQA that has a patient-centered medical home model. The Joint Commission and the AAAHC also do. And of course, many blues have their own homegrown initiatives. Uh, NCQA is certainly, however, the most uh, popular model and the most widely adopted model for, for various reasons that I don't have time to explain here. Um, so for example, and it used to pay $3 per member per month in many markets for those that achieved the NCQA level three. PCMH, they've sunsetted that program in various parts of the country. Um, frankly, they, uh, they were one of the first to market to be able to do this and did it for a substantially long time. I think they, they uh, had this in those markets for about five years. There's, they still are in some markets, but that's certainly a sunsetting. Um, recognition proves to payers that their savings and contracting opportunities with PCMH patients. We do a lot of contract negotiations at the Burden Group. The difference between talking to a payer about a practice that just sort of, you know, thinks that they're delivering good quality care and one that actually has the data to support all of the things that they're doing and how they're doing it and what that change has been over time, thanks to the PCMH uh, transition, is, is like night and day. Um, so it can be used to open negotiations and as leverage if there are no defined initiatives already in place with payers. And again, it really allows practices to work effectively with their pay for performance measures. And that is uh, really central to being able to validate and verify data that the payer may be sending to you, right? If you don't know your own data, how do you know their data is correct? And so we find 100% of the time there are errors in this data coming over from payers because frankly, they're pulling claims data and you may have more robust data at your practice that helps to really identify where those errors may be. To just illustrate a case, a client in Pennsylvania effectively utilized their PCMH recognition with two payers. One payer had no PCMH incentives at all, but they did recognize that the practice was contributing extra value, right? And so their base fees were actually increased by 8%. That's where we landed there. Uh, a second payer had a pay for performance program and the practice failed to achieve it. They went through the PCMH transformation. They really put a, a focus on selected HEDIS measures that were inherent in the pay for performance program, and they were able to exceed by a wide margin the base line metrics and, and therefore receive quarterly bonus payments under that contract. So we were really pleased to see that. Last, uh, I think this is our last but not least section that I'm going to touch on, and then I'm going to turn this over to Chip. Um, I, I would be remiss if I didn't say uh, that, you know, PCMH really creates a culture of ongoing improvement, right? By everybody sort of having a roadmap to how to focus on improving quality, being really involved in patient satisfaction, really helping each other to improve and deliver better, um, better quality of care as well as more effectiveness of care. We find that, you know, the staff are, are inspired, right? They want to improve their workflows. They want to come up with ideas and suggestions, and it really helps to focus on those key areas of care. All of this really drives your practice culture, your mission, and your vision, and again, decreases burnout and staff turnover. A case of that uh, is really a supergroup in New Jersey recognized three times by NCQA. They went through 2011, 2014, 2017. They require all new practice members to go through the NCQA program. That builds quality and, and savings from the ground up, right? So each new incoming practice has to actually achieve that over a fairly defined period of time in order to build in that quality. They continue to achieve high scores across a variety of metrics, despite the fact they've been through this three times, right? So, you know, I often say, gee, there's only so much, you know, you can, you can squeeze. Um, but frankly, they keep squeezing and they, you know, they have their data points climbing higher and higher and higher, right? So where they had achieved 90%, for example, in 2011, 2017, they're at 94%. And I sort of look at that and say that that is absolute um, magic. And last but not least, improves patient satisfaction, right? It helps create a reputation for excellent care. Patients are happy to talk about your practice when they receive good care there. It involves patients in their own care, right? Patients are more familiar with care plans. They're reading patient education handouts that you're delivering to them, and they really are just sort of much more involved in, in their care in general. Okay, I'm gonna turn things over to Chip Hart now, and uh, he can give you some very specific uh, details from there. All right, everyone. Uh, I presume you can hear me. Um, I've just got a couple minutes left. I want to. I want to be provide some really acute and specific examples because it's. Um, uh, I want to the the portion that I represent here, following Dr. Cressley and Suzanne, is the um, sort of on the ground practical uh, results. And Su Susan, pardon me, Suzanne has worked in dozens and dozens of practices directly, uh, and, and some of them have been our clients, and we've worked with practices who uh, didn't work with the Verdon Group, and so we, we've seen it both, and she's seen from both sides, but I can give some very acute examples here of 
our experience as a partner walking through the PCMH pra uh, process with independent peats. The first thing we have to realize, though, is that there is massive selection bias. And the reason I say that is the most the practices most likely to participate and succeed at a PCMH program are the ones who are already very well organized as a rule. And certainly there's a there's definitely a distribution of organization quality among them, but um, the high performers tend to be high performers. I mean, so what is the potential for high performing practices? It's not dissimilar from a skinny person going to Weight Watchers. Um, <laughs> there is not, for a lot of these practices, the gains they make are the hardest gains of all. And I'll show you an example or two here in a minute. But I, I want to be clear, even though I, I could have pulled up some examples of, of practices who had who'd never done fluoride varnish or who were really bad at developmental screening or whatever the case may be, they never did it. Um, to, go, to have a practice go from 0% to 50% developmental screening is fantastic, but that's, those are more exceptions. A more common thing to see is a practice that's already doing, already feels like they're doing developmental screening every time. And in fact, we move the needle from 80 to 90%. So in, let me give you an example here. So here is a practice in New Jersey that happens to be the super group that uh, Suzanne was referencing. Um, and uh, they, this is their well visit coverage over time. And at first, you, you might be horrified by seeing some of these numbers here, like, oh my gosh, they went from 88% down to 80% during this time frame. Um, but I want to point out a couple things, because this is not atypical. Um, when they passed and when they got recognition in 2017 for their uh, PCMH, um, the work that they did to pass actually started, starts about a year before. And in fact, when, when we work with the Verdon Group, when I talk to the crew there and I say, you know, at what point do you want to measure? We usually me go about a year back and then measure uh, uh, three or four months after they've been um, recognized. And what you see here is a really good example of the kind of thing that we see. They, they go from 80, I'm, I'm approximating, but they go from approximately 80% three to six year old well, well visit coverage to 86 well visit, uh, percent well visit coverage. Or over the course of three PCMH recognitions, they go from 95% to 98% well visit coverage. Now, those of you who are on the phone, I, I know because I looked at the big the list of attendees, and I, I, there are a fair number of independent practices on here, a bunch of our clients, and they know what their scores are for this. But for those of you who don't know these numbers acutely, this practice with these numbers right here is already way ahead of the national average. Okay, It sounds awful to think that um, being between 80 and 90% well visit coverage for three to six year olds is good. The, at the real average, I think I'm saying this off the top of my head, is closer to 70%. And so for them to say during their, during their preparation for the 2017 PCMH, a recognition that they're going to focus on their well visits from for three to six year olds for them to move from to from that 80 to 86 percent or that 78 to 86 percent that is actually really really good work is very difficult to move up to that last 10 percent as a rule so that's one thing i i just wanted to point out um and so for those of the types of people who attend a pc pcc webinar about uh, PCMH are already high performing. <laughs> so I just want to set your expectations. You're, it's impossible to hit 100. Well, it's not impossible, but it's almost impossible. So let me let me point out something else that we noticed. All right. So this is a this is a key and important piece here. One of the things that PCC does for our clients is we have a dashboard and we rate people. We rank them. We give them a score. There's 70. That that image right there is a picture I stole out of it. And we rank them on two things. We, we go into a lot of details, but we give them a financial score and a clinical score. And one of the things that we learned the day we rolled this out is that there's a very high correlation between those two things. Right here is I, I grabbed a big sample of our clients and I just did a distribution map of, of the scores for our clients. You can see the correlation visually right here. I think uh, it's about a, there's a, not a, 70% correlation. And basically what that tells us is that, look, the practices who are good at doing things clinically, the ones who seek out improving their clinical functionality are the ones who also do well financially. It is very rare. And in fact, you can see it here on the graph. It's very rare to find a practice that does well financially who doesn't do well clinically. And I, I know Sue Cressley's practice, and I know the same things that she does, and when she advocates on SOPUM um, about the things she does for her patients, it's that same organizational skill, it's that same interest, 
um, it's that same ability to articulate um, what needs to be done for patients that she uses when she turns around and talks to the payers. And that pays off. And, you know, Suzanne Madden and I have talked about this endlessly. So any what we see over and over and over again is that anything we do to improve someone's clinical acumen or deliverable or anything like that pays off financially. Suzanne talked very heavily. I'm going to give you a couple examples here in a second. Su Suzanne um, gave some very specific examples about, in particular, how you could turn around and apply these to your contracts. Well, one of the things that happens most often is that we're out actually very often looking for additional services like developmental screening, like fluoride, like making sure people get in for their well visits. And so let me tell you what we found. All right. First of all, when we work, when PCC works with practices, and we spend a lot of time doing what I'll call change management or helping practices transform, it's a big part of our shtick, okay? And what we find over and over again is it's usually pretty easy to get the smaller practices, the three or four doctor practice, to come in and explain to them anything from E&M coding to how important it is to give HPV. All it takes is one or two of us doctors and a three doctor practice to get it and that ship can turn and you have a huge impact. Well, one of the things that's different about PCMH um, versus other things that you often try to teach practices is that you can do it in a large practice. You can go to a 20 or 30 doctor group and actually have profound success there and moving a like the super group I just pointed out to you. I don't know how many doctors they have probably 30, let's say 35 um, to get a 35 doctor practice to go from 90 to 95 percent coverage on their well visits is an enormous task. And that's the sort of thing that PCMH can do. The other thing that PCMH does that we see this a lot is that PCMH sets a new plateau. I don't see a huge amount of retreat. when a, Once a practice accomplishes something and that clinical uh, deliverable is now part of their practice culture, they don't give up on it. It's the new norm. Now, the downside to this is both Dr. Cressley and Suzanne will point out to you is that the payers sort of wake up and say, well, now that everyone's awesome, we're not going to pay you special you know, special uh, amounts for doing that. It, it does set the new bar for everyone, but that's a that's an important item right there. You want to be the person setting the plateau. You don't want to be the person catching up. Um, there are some, uh, I'll say, call them positive side effects from the work that gets done with PCMH. Um, two of them, they're very sneaky, and this only for people like me who are on the call who are big practice management nerds, this might be exciting for you, but for the rest of you, forgive me. But one of the things that you can absolutely see is a big jump in the number of diagnoses per visit that are recorded for people when they go through PCMH because it, there are a variety of PCMH projects that would drive you to use a broader diagnostic set or a more specific diagnostic set. And just as an aside, there is unequivocally a correlation between the number of diagnoses that appear on your claims and how well you are paid. That's a lecture for another day. But we can see right away when someone's working on PCMH because their diagnoses jump up. The other thing that happens, which is really exciting, is your RVUs go up because now you're doing procedures with RVU values that you weren't necessarily doing before. And RVUs, the, the line between RVUs and the revenue generated a visit is direct and it's immediate and, and we can see that right away. Um, finally, the last thing that we see is that people are waking up to the fact that the single most important thing you can do to drive up your immunization rate, all right, what not just for HPV but for everything else, is to get kids in for their well visits. The, the fact of the matter is, pe although pediatricians do miss immunization opportunities from time to time, by and large, they don't, okay? They are 90, 95, 99% of the time, if a kid needs a shot, they know it and they give it. It is so built into the way they do things that, that, uh, that they don't miss those opportunities. When, kid, when a practice has a poor immunization rate, it's almost always because their well visit rate is low. Those two things, as well as, frankly, any of, your, any of your screenings, your developmental screenings, behavioral screenings, all of that stuff, they all go hand in hand. So the most important thing a practice learns when going through, going through the PCMH process is how important their business is, or, or how important well visits are to the business of their practice. Okay, so... Um, I think this is my last slide, so we have time for questions. Now, I, I got to hear like two minutes ago, I was looking at it. We have a, a rendering problem on the screen. This is supposed to be two columns, and I, I didn't notice what happened here. Something happened in translation. So I'm just going to have to basically point it out to you um, instead of it being obvious what's on the screen. I grabbed the North Carolina practice who Suzanne referenced in her slides, 
And I said, okay, well, how did they do? And I, I called into their practice and I looked. And, I, and for the time frame, for the year leading right up to uh, when they were recognized until three months after, I didn't cheat and move any months around. I just said, Let, well, let's see what they did. What we see right away is that the revenue per visit increased by 5% during that time frame. That's the financial impact over there. Um, and that is enormous. If your revenue per visit increases by 5% every year, um, you're, as a pediatrician, that's substantial. All right. And they did that um, not in the year that the immunization, you know, that um, 90460s and 461s were recognized or anything like that. This was just recently. So their revenue per visit went up five by 5%. Their three to six year old well visit coverage rates went up by 7%, their 7 to 11s went up 9%, and their 12 to 17 year olds increasing that co coverage by 10% is not much short of a miracle. And um, their RVUs per visit went up by 3% during that time frame. That is, for a practice of that size and that scope, not only does this have a profound effect, I'm, I'm just going to do some math in my head and I'm going to say that affected three or 4,000 kids in that community, which is, the, I mean, the whole purpose of PCMH. I mean, if you really believe in this concept, that should give you goosebumps. But that revenue per visit boost of 5%, that's where the practice now has resources to turn around and expand and do it again. So I'm going to stop here. Um, and I will, I think, because that is my last slide, right? Oh, no. Sorry, I did have one more slide. Everyone can see the slide. You have the handout. It's the same thing. The only thing you need to know about this slide is that the blue and red lines are on the left y-axis and the yellow line, which is the fluoride. I wanted to show an example of one practice re, um, really jumping up quickly. Um, the fluoride is the right y-axis. So this is a practice who just recently passed, and they were at um, about 15% uh, fluoride coverage rate, um, and they jumped to 28. So anyway, that is my last slide. I will now turn it over. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Chip and Suzanne and Susan. That was a great set of presentations. This is Ann Greiner again. And one of the questions that we got in advance, which I think, Chip, you've uh, done a standout job responding to, is um, if whether or not the financial outcome of ROI for practices undergoing PCMH transformation has been quantified. So I think you showed that um, the relationship between financial performance and clinical performance and then gave some very specifics with that one practice from North Carolina. So that's that's very exciting. And um, uh, Suzanne, you may be able to add to that as well as I think your presentation did. Um, other questions that came in over the transom, um, uh, one uh, relates to small practices and strategies that you might recommend um, for, for small practices that do not have a lot of leverage with payers. How do they get good value-based contracts? Um, so maybe we would start with uh, you, Suzanne, uh, to respond to that question, and others can jump in. Yeah, it, it really is a problem, right? Because the smaller you are, the, the harder it is to even get the attention of a payer, um, let alone, you know, move it all the way through a contract negotiation and be able to, you know, come out with something fruitful at the end of it. So I think we really, you know, as an industry need to start recognizing that practices that go through a PCMH transformation are delivering considerable savings back to the payers, right? So so I, I sort of see this as pushing on a couple of levers. One is, you know, helping to engage uh, associations and the AAP uh, and the AMA and anybody that will listen and PCPCC, right, to, to really, you know, march this out to payers and say, look, you really need to pay for this. This is, there, there's substantial research and a substantial body of evidence to support that this really does improve care and this also, you know, delivers cost savings to payers. So we definitely need to do that. And, and that's why I like to hold that up as a poster child. They just did it, right? They just gave additional revenues to practices to do whatever they needed to do with that extra $3 per member per month. And that was really effective for a lot of practices. Practices. So we absolutely have to come at it from that perspective. The other perspective is we have to make, you know, pediatric practice voices heard, right? And so don't hesitate to reach out to payers. The first question is, hey, what are you doing about PCMH? Do you have a PCMH program that we could sign on to? If not, what are you going to do for us specifically? We're helping here. The reality is a lot of payers want to have larger scale programs, right? So they do have plenty of population health programs, but usually you have to have a minimum of, you know, 500, 1,000, 5,000 covered lives before they'll actually give 
give you a contract you know specific to that so to that I say look it really does not take too much more to um, manage a program like Aetna's three dollars per member per month than it does to manage these bigger programs if you're having to pull the data for thousands of small Wednesday Tuesday type practices and yeah I get your point Mr. Payer but so why not just do something that's a little bit more effective such as a per member for months very simple to administer program that actually rewards practices you know for moving through this so so those are my two my two pieces on that you know one um, we have to get it out to industry we have to put some pressure on the payers and two you know ask if you don't ask you don't get so at least make your voice heard at the very least it will engage the payers in a dialogue with your practice Thank you very so much, uh, Ann Garner. Again, oh, go ahead, go ahead, Susan. So, so, so I want to jump in here just as my personal practice because uh, I'm a, a, a started in solo in 2004 and now just uh, I added my fourth doc. So, um, this is possible, but I and it's related to the question before. So, doing this transformational work, if you become a quality rock star, all care is really delivered. Um, at the practice level. And so if you can really move the needle on quality, not only does it improve your payment because you're bringing in services you didn't, um, my practice was able to get um, the hundredth percentile rank for one of our payers in our area of everyone in the geography, which grabs attention. We also were able to demonstrate that we had lower cost of care because our kids stayed out of the ER. Um, and they eventually will look at that data if you're a star performer and say, okay, how did you make this happen? And then the answer is, um, with a lot of hard work that you need to keep um, giving us appropriate resources and payment to sustain our transition. Um, so I was able to actually recon uh, recontract. And the other issue is, and I've said to them um, point blank, if, you, if the payers do not understand that they, in order, if they don't do some efforts to keep independent small practices or medium or large size practices viable, um, at some point those patients will go to larger integrated healthcare systems and there's been now a lot of data that says that same patient in a larger healthcare system costs the payer significantly more money. The third piece of this is that more and more of our healthcare is being delivered in employer-sponsored healthcare and the employer's care. And I've been able to do some negotiating with my school district um, about trying to set preferences um, for patients who are patient-centered medical home um, and that their employees get incented um, to, to see and have a lower copay um, if they see a, a practice that's a, a recognized medical home. So it's cutting around um, the edges, but there are ways to do it. Yes, uh, this is Ann Greiner, and I, I think um, it's very laudable that you all have, um, you know, gone right, right to the payer or the employer and spoken to them directly, and um, you know, we're we're successful in renegotiating terms. We also at the PCPCC are working with large health plans and employers to have more um, primary care friendly um, benefit design. There was a question that came in about. Um, high deductibles and how that may be having an effect on practices. Um, you know, uh, no co-pays or deductibles for primary care services, um, putting requirements in for their contracting with health plans to um, contract with more and more PCMH, speaking to them about incentive payments. So I think that it's going to take, it's, it's going to take a village. Um, you know, to to affect these changes, and we all need to be working on it. Um, I, I also did want to mention that in addition to uh, AAAHC and NCQA, the Joint Commission and also URAC are also accreditors of patient-centered medical homes, just to round out uh, the array of organizations. And then states themselves um, sometimes uh, have their own uh, requirements, just to make sure that folks are, are clear about that. Um, another question that came in uh, related to the um, agreements that um, specialists and primary care and pedi pediatricians may have to encourage um, uh, uh, communication. And one question was if Dr. Cressley would be willing to share examples of the letters she sends to the non-compliant specialists um, to encourage better compliance. I hate to put you um, on the spot. No, there, I'm more than I'll, be a real I'm more than happy to, and we'll, <laughs> I will email them to you, and you can add them and distribute them to the attendee list. 
sorry for putting you on the spot, Sue, but it's it was too good not to share. Nope. It works. It totally works. That's great. Um, what are some leading um, population management strategies um, that practices are using, um, you know, to improve uh, to improve pop health for for children, and what are some of the associated staffing to accomplish those goals? Is another question that came in over the transcript. Who would like to answer that? So kind I'll of start. A big to, question, but uh, <laughs> go yeah, ahead. it's hard without <laughs> narrowing it down a little bit. So. Yeah. So the first thing the first thing that has to happen is practices need to have a true understanding of who their patients are. You cannot begin to manage the patient population if you don't know who they are. And that starts with designing some way in your workflow or in your PM um, system or your EHR of which are active patients, what you do if you haven't seen in a patient in two years, do you then roll them off and say they're not yours anymore, Do you? how do you do that? Do you have to first figure out who your active patients are and manage them? Um, and then I think you pick um, low-hanging fruit and you pick something like, you know, it's it's the summer and the teens all need well visits because they're going to call me in September and say, I need my form filled out yesterday. So go recall those and get them up for well visits. And you can, um, and you start small and you figure out who's the best person in your office to do it. And you stick them in the back office. The other thing that we didn't talk about is staff needs protected time to do this. They cannot do this while someone's asking them to give a nebulizer in room two and a throw culture in room one. You need to have someone who's got the time dedicated somewhere to work at this. Um, I now have my staff, and, and I have a re really unique model. I got rid of, um, I sort of use lean principles, and I have four doctors and five staffs. They're all RNs. They cross-train and they do everything. I got rid of the um, the, the middleman and the pass-offs in my office. So um, all the nurses have a panel and a recall list that they're constantly running. We run it every two weeks at this point because we know that we're trying to catch up and get the new patients so that you're not just doing this in the summer and then being overwhelmed. So knowing your active patients, managing your active patients, picking a small project with low hanging fruit to work the kinks out, and then broadening it is the right way to do it. Well, thank opinion. you so much. Uh, that was a great explanation, um, and, and um, I applaud you for answering such a large question um, in such a concise manner. Um, unfortunately, we are at we are over the top of the hour, um, and there are hundreds of people still on the line, which suggests to us that we're going to have to um, have another webinar soon that uh, relates to pediatric practices. There's certainly a whole lot of interest in this topic, and there's many, many questions we didn't get a chance to tackle. Um, please join me in thanking our um, standout panelists, um, uh, Susan, Suzanne, and Chip, for their contributions. and. Uh, we applaud uh, all the work that you're doing to improve pediatric care, and um, thank you all for joining this afternoon. Bye now. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks for having us.